So Adventists think the mark of the beast is going to be a law enforced by the civil governments to, you know, by a quote unquote one world leader, perhaps the Antichrist figure who will cause um, all people to, by, by, by uh, the arm of the state, all, um, honor Sunday as the Sabbath as part of their duty to the law, the moral law of God. So people will ask me, do you think this, you think Sunday is the mark of the beast and it's somebody who keeps Sunday, right? So how do you answer that question? <clears throat> the answer is yes, of course. But when someone says, you think Sunday, going to church on Sunday is the mark of the beast. Well, it's kind of like saying, you think food, you know, well, it's, you could take that a lot of different ways, right? And of course people do because they often say that incorrectly that Adventists believe that if you keep Sunday, you have the mark of the beast is what they derive from that statement. You think the mark of the beast is going to, it will be Sunday worship. You think that, right? And the answer is yes, but what do you mean? Because this is the thing. People infer from that, Oh, so you think everybody who keeps Sunday through church history has the mark, had the mark of the beast and the mark of the beast means you are going to hell. No, we don't believe that. Well, then you're lying. You're being dishonest. You're being deceptive. No, your question is your, your assumptions based on what you derive from that interaction is not careful. So. Is it Sunday the mark of the beast? Why would I hesitate? Why are you being dishonest or deceptive? Or maybe you smoke cigars with Satan in a boardroom in a tall building somewhere. Like Trump Tower or, or uh, the one his stepson owns that has 666 as the street address. Oh, maybe the barcode on your products for food. I mean, I mean, you got two things correlating there, right? Barcodes. You buy it, you use it to buy and the stores use it to sell and you buy it. And they put 666. I won't get into that, but you can go ahead and set that aside, Dr. Hovind, because it's silly. But I think his point is just it could be a quality, it could be part of it. But what is the text really wanting us to get from it? Is it really about is God really going to throw people in hell because they used a uh, pricing and sales point of sale system that has the wrong letters in it or numbers? Or is, is the numbers given to identify the source of what the faulty um, teaching is? Doesn't that seem more likely? Like you identify the system of the Antichrist with that number, which has ties to historical figures in a particular um, empire, let's call it, to be, to be vague on purpose because of the nature of the prophecy. It's a Roman thing. It has application in the first century, likely. And it was a way for him to speak of that figurehead of that empire, uh, kind of on the down low, like we call it today, right? And then that has application for future that future system, which is that final empire put out in Daniel 2 and 7. Um, he comes out of Rome in some in some way, okay, to be to be a uh, non-particular, but what is fact is it comes out of Rome and it's that system that the right, the mountain cut out without hands strikes and which empire lasts forever, which is given to Christ and his saints, according to scripture. So why is the mark of the beast not your grandma who kept Sunday as a Presbyterian in uh, you know, the early 1900s? Because it's not the mark of the beast unless it's enforced. In other words, it's forced upon you in opposition to obedience to God, which is the whole principle underlying the entire Protestant Reformation. What do I mean? Well, some people think it's about once saved, always saved. And the, and the Catholic Church didn't give people assurance. I disagree with that. That's kind of, that's a, about as deep as saying the gospel is one saved, always saved, or, oh, it kind of reminds me of people who ask the question, you think Sunday is the mark of the beast? And I hesitate to say yes, because of what I know they'll do with that information, because they don't want to know or understand. They want to use that against you. 
and then they'll misrepresent you on purpose or out of stupidity or ignorance. And it is stupidity sometimes. In other words, dumb on purpose, not just ignorance. But that's we have to be careful because some people are just simply ignorant. So they may they can you can understand how they could make the mistake of misrepresentation because there after all there are actual cults that use certain means that are not biblical to trap people in false teaching. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not one of those. Here's a here's an example of why I, I believe that. Because when I read other commentaries on Revelation, it's very similar or close to what I was taught from the Adventist Church. Um, when I was in academy, an Adventist school in my senior Bible year, um, my teacher, who's also a pastor, Pastor Bill Roberts, great guy, by the way, can't help but see Jesus in that guy all the time. Um, at my friend's funeral, they were telling me that everybody, a lot of people went to have a beer at the bar and he showed up and he just, no judge, judgmental there. He was just there to support everybody and they were drinking. And that's of course a no, no in Adventism, but he looks past that considering the circumstances, things like that. Not that he approves of it. Absolutely not. Of course. But my point is when he was my senior Bible teacher, he, he had this policy with the seniors that I, I'm trying to remember. I want to be, don't want to misrepresent or mis uh, remember here, but I know there was people from a different church, Protestant church, maybe Catholic or something. And then like maybe an atheist or, or an agnostic type or a Jew or just people that have a different view than we did would come. He ha had them come in and give their case, you know, for their position. In other words, I think they, they recognize that um, you can't really in, nobody wants to actually indoctrinate you can't indoctrinate someone with truth by sheltering them from other things they need to believe it for themselves that's a very strong um, principle that i was taught at least where i grew up in the seattle greater seattle area and i went to adventist schools my whole life and so we had bible classes one of our classes every school year you know and church and every week every sabbath and so i think he recognized that you know, people are going to leave if once they find out other opinions. So might as well deal with it now, honestly. And so that principle was instilled in me to not hide from things and to explore. And that it was very much ingrained in me that you have to come to believe this kind of a Baptist principle, right? Like believers baptism sort of thing. It's like you have to come. You're not going to have any grounding or anchor in the truth if you don't come to the conclusions with your own reasoning. And considering, you know, all the uh, different views and why we believe what you believe. So I'm proud of that. So people say often say things like Adventists often are deceptive in their evangel evangelical series when they do a Revelation and Daniel seminars. They don't necessarily put big Seventh-day Adventist things on it as though they want to hide it. Well, let me tell you, there is a sense that they don't advertise it up front by necessity because... There's so much bad thinking out there that people will avoid it. It's like, look, if you're scared that Adventists are going to trick your people, you must think your people are very stupid and you want to shelter them from exploring the Bible. You, your priority, in other words, is keep them stupid so they don't get fooled by other people rather than making them sufficient or proficient in their understanding. So that and then, you know, having a desire for them to uh, see the truth for themselves. So, look, if you're scared to let your people hear another view and study it, show themselves approved from scripture, which is what Adventist evangelical media, you know, um, evangelist sort of meetings on eschatology do, then shame on you. You should invite Adventists in and let them give their case to your, to your people and then demonstrate why you're, you have a superior view. This is how, you know, Protestant interaction should occur because we care about the truth from the word of God, not, not just blindly following denominations, right? So that's a, I think that's a proper principle. And so the mark of the beast, yes, it is it is Sunday worship, but it has to be. We believe that people who have kept Sunday will be judged according to the light they had. So look, if you've if you've and look, Adventists historically have uh, fallen in the ditch of legalism 
if, if you have, you know, or not having assurance. Okay. That's an issue in the Adventist church, but fundamentally we believe you can have assurance. That is the proper teaching. Do we, do we have a majority of the struggles that Adventist um, parishioners or whatever you want to call them members of the church? Yes, that is a struggle in Adventism. Doesn't falsify the belief. What is the other side of the road? Well, free grace theology, in the sense as it is a theological view, you know, in opposition to the historical Christian view. That's the that's the ditch piled up with a mountain of people. People are proud, proud to be that. Honk for Jesus and you're saved no matter what. See a bumper sticker in your drunken stupor and mentally assent. Never think about the gospel again. Eat babies for breakfast and worship Satan every day, all day. You're saved. There's so many problems with that. I don't even want to get into it. But, you know, that's the extreme version. People believe that. And that is the extreme end, of course. And every, and then it just trickles down to the middle of the road. Okay. Regarding the different perspectives. And look, these issues can be issues in any denominational church, legalism and and um, whatever you want to call it, uh, misplaced free grace or something, or not that grace isn't free in the certain sense is how we receive it, but it's a non-meritorious a gift of God, which is justification and reconciliation and the foundation of the gospel, of course, yes. But another thing that should be part of the gospel, which a lot of people don't understand, is that the, the law of God, whatever that is in the new covenant, it, it, it flows from the character of God. And if in, the Bible says God does not change, Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. That is, you can't use that uniformly on any subject. God became a human. He was incarnate. That's a change. A very important fundamental change when Jesus becomes a, a fully human and he's fully God, right? He wasn't fully human before he was incarnated. That's a change, right? So what does that verse mean? Well, it's what it certainly means is the character and the love of God is perfect. God cannot sin. So if it means anything, it means it there. In the what's been historically called the moral commands, which have application in all the different tiers of the law. Okay, so don't misunderstand me. Don't get caught up in that. There are things which are moral and things that are not moral in the law, whether or not the Bible categorizes it that way. These are helpful facts. You know, it isn't the same thing to talk about the penalties given in the old covenant under a theocracy in the first covenant and talk about the aspects of the law, which are dealing with punishment, which are not implemented by God anymore because he's not running a theocracy in this dispensation, let's say, in the new covenant dispensation. Through which you are saved by that covenant in this dispensation. OK, the new covenant, which is. The covenant of Christ's blood that justifies you, right? That covenant doesn't have that application of the penalties of the law. That's certainly true. But God is still the same God, and he still has the same character and love, which are definitions of the moral commands. How to fully exemplify the image of God in through your person, which Jesus demonstrated for us. Perfect love, okay? Sacrificial. Putting the other before yourself after putting God first. How do we? How do you put the invisible God first? By raising your hand when no one's looking in a church service? By mentally making mental assent? Well, the demons do that. So, is the mark of the beast Sunday worship? Watch for part two of why that is obviously the best candidate. And, um, but... It is not what saves, of course, to worship on Saturday. It is the fruit of an abiding, faithful relationship in Christ, the foundation, author, finisher of our faith. But God is clearly testing. And there is an idea of this remnant. They are not all Israel who are of Israel. There is a bride that he's, will be presented spotless without wrinkle made perfect by Christ. We know there are false converts. 
There are people who go out from us because they were not truly of us. There are those who feast with you, who will be found to not have the garments and they'll be thrown out of the wedding feast, as it were. There are those, there are brides, there are 10 virgin brides, half of which don't have enough oil, which will have the door shut in their face. And yes, that means they're not saved. Now you can make up whatever you want regarding, well, they were never really of us, even though that's really kind of a misapplication of that verse. You can say they were never saved. Well, they're called virgins. They're called servants by Jesus. They were unfaithful servants. Is that just talking about the Jews? Well, you're going to say they were never really saved, but they were the elect? Maybe. Hypothetically, but you don't know that. Is what we do know, because we're not omniscient, but what from the text says is that there are false converts that were to love people and minister to them to give them a relationship with Christ and not condemn them completely, although you have to be practical at some with some situations in your life obviously you're not going to let a hobo off the street who just got out of rehab babysit your three daughters for the weekend right oh don't be judgmental he said he believes in christ what you oh you don't trust him oh are you better than him a pharisee oh you avoid uh reckless drivers on the road what you think you're better than them Oh, you don't eat high fat, high cholesterol food because you want to live longer? I guess you're better than me. Oh, you think you can keep the commandments? Yeah, you have to. It's your duty. God defines love, not you, not your emotional state. Although, leaning on the side of putting others first probably co does cover a multitude of sins, even if you're wrong. Like, let's say God doesn't accept gay marriage, which it seems he doesn't, but you, you're loving people while the rest of the Christian church hypocritically condemns these people and thinks they're gross. Then he turns around and tells people you can't keep the commandments, but gay, it, yeah. Come as you are, except if you're gay. Free grace. God, Jesus nailed the law to the cross, which I don't know why these people even need a savior if there's no, nothing to, def to define their sin. Whosoever will may come, come as you are. I'm just forgiven, honey. Well, just don't be gay. I mean, forget about it if you had any kind of abuse or something, sexual abuse that confused you, which is perhaps some people who have untraditional um, practices regarding their sexuality. Not all. I don't begin to pretend like I know. But I know what's certainly true is because I've talked to these people. Are they victims? Or are they for their sin crimes? Are they unsavable? Jesus wept.